We need to begin, begin, I think, today in Ezekiel chapter 20. If you're getting tired of the subject of Israel, how shall I say it? There's something about that unique subject, central to the heart of God and to Paul, that is not just an addendum, let alone a tangent. It's at the heart of the heart of the heart of the matter. But the kingdom is a Davidic kingdom, or it's not the kingdom of God at all. God has elected and appointed a people through whom it is to be established and with whom he gave its, his promise of it to, his, to their king on your throne. But it's not a kingdom for the um, benefit of Israel exclusively. It's intended for all nations through that nation. So we need always to be reminded of the comprehensive global intention of God that Israel is not some um, uh, sidelight. It's just what he has elected and appointed to be central to the nations that out of Zion shall go forth the law and out of Jerusalem the word of God. Why? Because he will elect what he will elect. Because he will choose what he will choose. Because he'll have mercy upon whom he will have mercy. Because he is who he is. Because I am that I am. And to prove that point, I'm going to select the people that you would never have chosen. The least of your considerations. And I even told them, don't think I chose you because you were the greatest. I chose you because you were the least. Merely to make the point that I am God and I will choose what I will choose. I am that I am. So eat your heart out, you Gentiles. Spit your guts out if you don't like it. You wanted Mount Everest or something else? He chose the hill of Zion and he called it holy. Well, we're going to talk about wilderness. Israel has got to pass through the wilderness of the nations. And I don't think that that necessarily means some kind of savage, wild, barbaric uh, environment, though it, likely that will be included because they have to be brought, as I said yesterday, to such despair and hopelessness and futility. Cerebral, intellectual Jews with their university degrees and their plaques and their awards, will that all of their attainment will serve nothing when they're stripped and find themselves in environments that are so terrifying for which no university degree could have been a preparation. They have got to be so reduced. There's something about the nature of wilderness that strips men. It's a disorientation of all the things in which you have invested your confidence that they're not to be found there. And it's at that place and that stripping that we can hear the still small voice of God, that we can come to a first recognition that there are eternal and ultimate and cosmic considerations for which our sophistication had disqualified us. Our university degrees had kept us from the consideration of those things that are ultimate and eternal. But when you're stripped of them and you're in the grit of, of a threatening wilderness and close to perishing for, and seeing no way out, then the issue of life, purpose, eternity, nature, the God of it, comes into a new consideration. So we read in, in Ezekiel 20, in verse 33, and I have in italics over the commencement of verse 33, God will restore Israel. Where does the restoration commence? In the wilderness of the nations. Remember, remember Amos 9? I will sift you through all nations, Malaysia included, because Malaysia needs to be sifted. And in fact, something of that went on last night. As I live, says the Lord God, surely with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, and with wrath poured out, I will be king over you. Remember what Israel's last statement was? We will not have this man to rule over us. What a tragic statement. Because if you'll not have this man to rule over us, and you prefer Barabbas to Jesus, you'll suffer the consequence of that choice. And we have suffered it for 2,000 years. But we cannot continue in that rebellion against our own king. For if he will not rule over his own people, how shall he rule over the nations? 
I will be king over you. And I will bring you out from the peoples and gather you out of the countries wherein you are scattered with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm and with wrath poured out, I will bring you into the wilderness of the people and there I will enter into judgment with you face to face. How far will God go to affect his purposes with this people? He'll uproot them. He'll strip them. He'll bring them into environments and places that they would never have considered. And there he will meet with them face to face. How? By a wrath poured out. Are you reading the scriptures carefully? Twice now, in just these first verses, that phrase is repeated, with a wrath poured out. What else is going to move Steven Spielberg out of Hollywood? Or uh, the, the, uh, the guy who runs Time Warner Corporation, or the many places of influence and prestige and status that Jews occupy in the world. What will root them up and out and make them to flee with no more than their shirts on their back, leaving everything behind stripped? A wrath poured out. And there's no wrath more severe, more what's vindictive, more unwilling to be pacified by any kind of compromise than Islamic wrath. It has only one passion, and that is the annihilation of the Jew. Because what is behind it and fuels it is the wrath of the enemy that is threatened by even the the likelihood that any Jew will ever return to Zion in order to prevent the catastrophe of losing their usurping rule over the world they, the, their, their wisdom dictates that to remove the threat is to remove the people whose restoration means the coming of another kingdom that's the fury that God employs it he'll allow it because he's got to deal with his people and he can't meet them in their penthouses in Toronto. He's got to meet them in the jungles of Malaysia and other cruel, cruel places like where we ourselves are living in northern Minnesota, a hundred miles from the Canadian border, where God planted us, brought us supernaturally 32 years ago. With a wrath poured out, I will bring you into the wilderness of the peoples, and there I will enter into judgment with you face to face. As I entered into judgment with your ancestors in the wilderness of the land of Egypt, so will I enter into judgment with you, says the Lord God. I will make you pass under the staff and bring you within the bond of the covenant. Something is going to happen when I meet with you face to face. This is not going to be a little casual tea time. Something is going to take place. There will be a change. You'll break. You'll recognize who I am. King. And you'll submit to my authority. You'll come into the bond of the covenant and under the rod of my authority. And because of that, you'll return to Zion with everlasting joy on your heads. Something has happened to you in the wilderness. You've encountered God and you've encountered him face to face. Well, it raises the question, how can he be that personal, that revealing in so many places if it's the wilderness of the nations? We're talking about 13 to 15 million Jews uprooted suddenly and proliferated through the world in which God says I'm preparing an encounter for them in the place where they will be stripped I'll meet with them face to face and I want to tell you that my opinion is that you are that face to see you is to see him but of course if your face is only the face of religious respectability or uh, obligation like you're a you can't help it. You're not enjoying this. It's even a risk and a threat to be in relationship with these people. You will have lost the historic moment. I, I can't say enough for this. We're moving toward a, a climax of the age where God is grooming the church and preparing and fitting it to represent him and express him to them in their wilderness encounter. Because as I, I will show you, and I have already mentioned, I'll speak again today, this morning, you'll be with them in the wilderness place. You'll have prepared a place for them in the wilderness where they are fed for three and a half years. That's why the church must be present in the earth. But a church of what kind? Not a church of mere dutiful religious obligation that shows in their face that it will turn Jews off because they don't expect anything better from you. But the face of God the 
benign, loving, acceptive, unconditional love of God shining through you, that you're not intimidated by the, by the threat that if you extend yourself for this people, who are the least of these his brethren, it might cost you. You're willing for the cost, and you're so strange that you think that if it issues in some suffering on your part or even martyrdom, you'll win a crown. And that you're privileged to have part in the facilitating of the recovery of this people back to their king, to their land, and to his kingdom, that his rule might, might come over the nations, and that representatives of a newly redeemed priestly kind will come back into your own country and being a unique quality of blessing that it desperately needs and can only obtain from them as the nation of priests and light unto the world. For if they don't teach us the difference between the profane and the sacred, how shall we know it? You'll receive the benefit of your investment and that you're not afraid to make it and count it a privilege even if you have to suffer for it will be a staggering thing to Jews. And that you're not afraid, that, you, that you're enjoying a calm, that there's a peace with you past understanding. You're not terrified, you're not panic-stricken. You know that you're in the heart and will of God, and you consider it a privilege to be placed where you are and to be to them what you ought. They've never seen that. and They don't expect that. And when they see it, it's, it eclipses any category that they have understood Humanity, uh, in a humane way or a religious way or a philosophic way this is something transcendent this is beyond religion this is beyond categories that Gentiles should, should love us and, and have mercy on us and take pains and extend themselves at risk for us at the time that we're everywhere globally hated and in flight from the wrath that pursues us unto death what's with these people they're strange this is beyond religion even. I will make you pass under the staff and bring you within the bond of the covenant. In verse 38, I will purge out the rebels among you and those who transgress against me. I will bring them out of the land where they reside as aliens, but they shall not enter the land of Israel. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. This is clearly taking place in the nations. Then I will bring you back to the land of Israel. You'll be resurrected. Then I'll plant you in the land. It's in the nations where the great drama essentially takes place. Yes, there's a residue of Jews that remain, as we're told in Isaiah chapter 6, that there's a tenth, a, a root that remains. But the multitude are proliferated through the nations, and there they encounter God through you. And those that are rebels and transgress will not submit to the opportunity given of God He'll bring them out of the lands in which they have resided, but he will not bring them into the land. The land is for the redeemed. The land is for those who have come into a covenant relationship and know their God and, and they call him Lord. So it's a remarkable sifting. And as Jesus indicates, that this time of Jacob's trouble will exceed any trouble that the nation has previously known or will again know. So by that means and other testimony that even in Jesus' coming to save Israel in its final extremity, two-thirds have already perished, and one-third passes through the fire. So if we take that reckoning as being indicative not only of those who survive in the land, but those in the world, and can say that if two-thirds of all Jews perish, we're talking about 10 million Jews facing death in the time of Jacob's trouble, in order that a third, five million approximately, will return to Zion as the redeemed of the Lord, the surviving remnant and the newly established nation. You can pray for me. I'm pretty tough. But I don't know that I can live in such a time and watch my people suffering such attrition and wholesale death and keep my own moral stability. Will I collapse? Will I go down like a a, a, a sack? Will, will I be able to stand the, the horror of, uh, of what will be sweeping the world and be uh, unable to intercede and, and do only give a minimal grace to those that the Lord actually brings to us to our door or gives us opportunity to, to help? There's going to be a moral demand on the church. Now listen, you dear saints, many of us will not make it. Many of us will be disappointed. 
and God. What? Again, within a century, he's allowing a devastation that eclipses the Nazi Holocaust? Where's his love? What kind of a God is this? I thought he was going to establish the state of Israel. They came within inches of succeeding, and boom, the whole thing has gone down the drain, and these people are proliferated like straw all over the earth, and they're being pursued like animals unto death. Where's God? That's why Paul says one of the signs of the last days is a great falling away. And I believe the two principal factors for that wholesale apostasy is religious disappointment in the failure of the state of Israel to succeed, in the devastation that comes upon the nation that cannot be understood as coming from the hand of God, although the scriptures tell us it is his wrath that is being poured out, and the failure to be raptured. That we're strangely still here in that time of tribulation, and some aspect of it even threatens us as the church. These factors, I think, will greatly explain the falling away of many in the last days. Can you see how incumbent it is to have a prophetic understanding and anticipation of the calamities that will come and not be offended by them? Blessed is he who is not offended in me. Don't be offended that he's a God of wrath. His wrath is not some arbitrary impulse that he's uh, as if it's a human thing and he's out of sorts because he got out of bed the wrong way that day. His wrath is his indignation against sin, against unrighteousness. And it's got to be expressed if he's a righteous God and he's preparing a people for a kingdom of righteousness and that they should know him both in his severity of his wrath and in the mercy of his goodness. Well, how, how shall they make him known? The issue of, of God's judgment and our attitude toward the God of judgment, not merely to tolerate it as if we stand above God and we're condescending to allow him that right, but that we love his judgments because when his judgments are in the earth, the world will learn righteousness. His judgments are redemptive and they're followed by mercy or what does mercy mean? So, he's going to purge their house through judgment, remove their idols, their profane things. And on verse 44, on my holy mountain, the mountain height of Israel, says the Lord God, there all the house of Israel, all of them shall serve me in the land, and there I will accept them. There I will require your contributions, the choicest of your gifts, etc., a pleasing odor. There I will bring you out from the peoples, gather you out of the countries, where you have been scattered, I will manifest my holiness among you in the sight of the nations. Dum -da -dum -dum. God is not going to do this in a corner. He's not going to hide this. This is going to be an open spectacle for the observ observation of all the unbelieving nations that have railed against God and think that Allah is a competitor. They're going to see God visibly demonstrating himself both in judgment and in mercy upon a people that are proliferated through their nations so they'll see the actuality of his conduct toward them and acknowledge that this is very God. He's serving multiple purposes both for Israel and for the nations because the issue of Israel is the issue of the nations. In the sight of the nations you shall know that I am the Lord and I will bring you into the land of Israel the country that I swore to give to your ancestors. There you shall remember your ways and all the deeds by which you polluted yourselves, and you shall loathe yourself for all the evils that you have committed, and you shall know that I am the Lord when I deal with you for my name's sake, not according to your evil ways or corrupt deeds, O house of Israel, says the Lord God. I don't do this for your sake, but for my holy name's sake. But I'm going to do it. And I'll do it visibly that the nations themselves will recognize and see that there's only one way to understand both the wrath that has expelled Jews throughout all nations and the mercy that has restored its a remnant is clearly the supernatural work of a living God, the only God, the Creator, the King, the Holy One of Israel, the God of Israel Himself. What a demonstration. It's the finale of the age. There's no, no further demonstration of God as God to the nations than this. This is the ensign that God says in Isaiah, I will lift up. And if the nations will not heed this sign 
and this demonstration, there'll be no other opportunity. Then is, then is judgment. Then he comes in wrath against the nations. Then he brings judgment on those who refuse to accede and to recognize that he alone is God. This, this is epical. This is massive. The purpose is being served in the proliferation of Israel through judgment and the return is a statement for the nations to behold that they should be without excuse when the king comes in wrath and fury and men seek for places to hide from him and to turn from, from his face. For his name's sake. This is God's intervention. You know what? You modern believers, you need to consider, are you open and partial to divine intervention? Because even those who read that the desert would blossom as a rose prefer that it should be so through irrigation rather than through some divine supernatural enablement. There's something about us, that rationality that lingers, that is offended by the supernatural. We don't want a God who intervenes. It's not in keeping with our modern world. We, we rather have a, a construct where he set the world in motion, it ticks, and we're the ones who engineer and do and deliver and perform. But that he should come into his own world and to demonstrate himself in power, in judgment and in mercy, that can almost be offensive. So we need to make peace with God and his supernaturalness and his right to intervene. He's been quiet till now. He's been laying low. But in the last days, he's going to come. And even visibly, his feet will be on the Mount of Olives. And, and the Mount will split. And he will himself defeat uh, the enemies that have, uh, the nations that have come to destroy Israel. He will appear. And in his appearing, we shall see him whom we have pierced and mourn for him. Are you ready for this? Or are you too rational? Is it somewhat offensive that God should be that visible, that aggressive, that imminent in the world? See how searching this is? And how, what lingers in us and how much we're the product of the world more than we know and realize that there's an instinctive, almost an offense to consider that God would be that de demonstrative in his own world supernaturally. We would rather have a rational explanation, a human way of understanding and seeing, than to believe that God can be God like that. And Israel will know that I am the Lord when I deal with you for my name's sake. How many times we saw that last night in the text in Ezekiel 37? And you will know that I am the Lord who has spoken and performed this. You will know that I am the Lord. You've got to know that I am is the Lord. Because in John chapter 8, when they said to Jesus, Who do you think you are, hotshot? You're just a Johnny come lately. We have the prophets. We have a Father Abraham. Oh, he said, Well, don't you know that Abraham saw my day and was glad for it? What are you talking about? You're not even yet 50 years old. Abraham saw him your day? Yes. Because before Abraham was, I am. They took up stones to kill him for the blasphemy that this visible piece of humanity is equating himself with the God who spoke to Moses out of the burning bush. And Moses said, how shall we know you? What, what is your name throughout all the generations? I am that I am. And this Jesus carpenter piece of humanity that sweats is saying that before Abraham was I am and he's saying here and you shall know by these deeds that I am the Lord and that day his name shall be one and the Lord shall be one it's a great great drama dear saints and we're being fitted for our participation okay I want to center on being met in the wilderness by God through his people that they might glimpse his face not the face of religious obligation dutiful I guess I have to but the face of caressing love as if what a privilege God has sent you Jews to us wow do you like noodles do you like you know Because, as I've said several times, don't expect them to be on their best behavior. I'm a model Jew. Don't think that they're going to be like me. They're going to be 
mean-spirited. They're going to be totally whacked out because what has come upon them has come upon them suddenly. You expected it because God sent you me years in advance of the event. But for them, it has happened suddenly. They're stripped, evicted, thrown out, and find themselves in strange places in the world that they would never have themselves chosen. And they're going to be angry and not understand it and blame Christianity and the defects of the New Testament and every kind of prejudice that Jews carry. And they'll come before you with that spirit. They won't be grateful. And if you need their gratitude and and their compliments and you're not going to get it, will you feel snubbed? How about now? If somebody looks at you the wrong way or doesn't quite recognize you as you ought or says something of a kind that Uh, is not fully appreciative aren't you offended, wounded bothered and disturbed aren't you thin skinned now what about this stuff of Chinese saving face is that a rumor (laughs) so what does that mean Art that means that something has got to happen between the condition of God's people as it presently is and as they may be in that time when these Jews come that they will not be thin skinned that they will not be offended. They can love people in, even in their ingratitude, even in their mean-spiritedness. And we were ourselves were tested by my own Jewish mother. Yes, 96 years old, for 40 years, as long as I was in the faith. Arthur, I don't want to hear this anymore. Don't tell me. I don't want to hear this. I said, the day will come that the thing that you'll regret is that I did not say enough. Bitter could not mention the name of Jesus. Typical, stubborn Jewish woman, 96-year-old, dying with an oxygen tube in her nose, whom we kidnapped from Florida, where she was living in a condominium where her friends were dying like flies, and we got her out and brought her to Minnesota in the winter. She balked and sat with the boxes around her in the kitchen. I'm not moving. I said, okay, well, we're going. But she finally moved, and we got it. We built her a little house right next to my own, And there she lived till last year and was tended by the women of our community day and night. And about 3 o'clock in the morning in her 96th year, 10 days before her death, I was up. They said, Art, you come quickly. Your mother is terrified. She's panic-stricken. She's had a vision or a dream of hell. She's beside herself in fear. I came right down. And in 20 minutes' time, the Lord was pouring out of my mouth one O Bethlehem, afraid of though you be least of the cities of Judah, yet out of his shall he come forth unto you, uh, whose comings forth are from old and from everlasting. Messianic prophet. I didn't know I knew that much. Poured out like a flesh, like water, washing her until she could take my hand and follow me in a prayer t- to call upon the name of the Lord. And pass from death to life visibly before our eyes and to live 10 days as a believer and the next day to say what about the others the way is narrow the next day to say to me if you only knew how much God loves you she's telling me it's a wonderful thing to see your Jewish mother saved but it took the fear of hell she was terrified in order to call upon that name. And her next prayer was, Lord, if I've done anything wrong, please forgive me. It's so instinctive that to mention the name of Jesus is somehow unkosher, that she is asking apology for the name that has already saved her. But she's saved and gave a wonderful testimony for ten days before the Lord took her. She was saved in the wilderness of Minnesota. Our first fruit was my own mother... And you know what, you dear saints? I wouldn't be a bit surprised if she's in the cloud of invisible witnesses overhead in these days, looking down and saying, that's my boy. (laughs) Okay. Let's look at Isaiah 35 to give us a clue, and I've been uh, referring to this text, of our role with them in the wilderness and the solitary place shall be glad for them. 
Why? What's in it for the wilderness that they should be present and walking through the Malaysian jungle? Because as I walked around the neighborhood here and I saw the vegetation, you know what I said to one of my friends, the colleagues? I said, there's something decadent about the vegetation that I'm seeing here in Malaysia. It's overgrown, it's lush, it's decaying. It's, it's showing the corruption of nature. Nature itself needs to be redeemed from its bondage. It's remarkable that dumb and insensate nature is glad for them. You're not glad for them yet, as you ought, but nature will be. Because when nature sees them in the wilderness, it knows the time of our deliverance is at hand. Israel's redemption is our release from the curse that came from Adam. We're to be restored into our pristine condition. We're tired of being decadent jungles and just foliage and corruptive things. The creation itself shall celebrate, clap hands. The trees shall clap their hands. The hills shall skip as rams when they see them in the wilderness. The desert shall rejoice and blossom as the rose. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given unto it the excellency of Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord and the excellency of our God. Who is the they? They that are in the wilderness shall see the glory of God in his creation and the excellency of our God, not only in in the nature that God has created, even in its fallen condition, but also in those that will be with them who are now going to be addressed in verse 3. They're not identified and they're not named. But so God is speaking not to Israel here. He's speaking to someone who is with them in the wilderness, whom he can address and who hears him. And says, Strengthen ye the weak hands and confirm the feeble knees. They're the ones that are feeble. They're ready to collapse. They are expiring for the want of hope. They are destitute of hope. They are cut off and dry bones. They're ready to perish. Without hope you die. They're stretched out. They're not used to the rigors of wilderness. And they they don't see a way out. So God is speaking to someone who is with them. Strengthen you. Strengthen them with, with the strength that you have. Because you're not incapacitated by the wilderness. You're not the victim of their destitution. Your strength is in me. And you have a strength to expend and to express toward them. And I'm, I'm requiring you to do that. Say to them that are of a fearful heart, verse 4, Be strong, fear not, behold, your God will come with vengeance. Even God with a recompense, he will come and save you. Isn't that remarkable? It's the same word, say to them, that when we came to Isaiah 6, who shall go for us? Who shall we send? Here am I, send me. Okay, go and say. You're sent? Go and say. Here again, say to them. And it's the same kind of saying, because you're a sent one, because you're ordained, because you're anointed, because you're appointed, because your words are not just mere human comfort and sentimental pat on the back. Because sentiment stinks. Because sentiment is a false substitute for love and reality and truth and power. It's not sentiment they need. They need the word of the Lord that says your God will come as more than just a a hopeful suggestion. That when when these with them in the wilderness say your God will come, they're not just speaking out of their hat. They're not just giving a hopeful suggestion. They're speaking authoritatively. They're speaking of a reality of a God who doesn't need to be seen now as present in order to hope for his appearing. How how does anyone speak with that kind of prophetic confidence that anyone who hears them, their blind eyes are opened, their ears are unstopped, they leap, the lame leap? It's a word that is life-giving. It's an event. It's a prophetic utterance by those who know that their God will come by those who have had a previous wilderness experience themselves, have been brought to places of desolation where if God did not come for them, they would have perished spiritually, if not uh, physically. That they themselves have, before the advent of Jews, have been tested and tried and perfected in, in the dealings of God. So when the crisis time comes, they know their God, 
they can speak prophetically with confidence and commend him to unbelieving Jews in such a way that their word becomes an event. How do we come to this prophetic stature? Through suffering, through testing, through trial, through crises. Hey, listen, God can give you a witness experience right in your apartment in, uh, in uh, what's the capital city? Lumpur. Wherever you are, he knows how to bring wilderness conditions in your marriage, your family, your body, your fellowship, your job, your circumstance. He knows how to deal. And he will deal with those who are willing to be dealt with and be prepared and fitted so that when they speak a word, it's authoritative. It's not, I hope, I hope, I hope. Your God will come. It's a saving word that God has got to be certified and attested before His actual appearing. That the, that the hearing of the word already gives a confidence that indeed, before He comes, we, we know that He will come and therefore we will not perish. This is the difference between life and death. Is your word prophetically spoken in prophetic authority when it's commanded? Say to them, He will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened. Remember when they were closed? When Isaiah came and said to them, their eyes were closed, their hearts were made heavy, they could not understand to be saved. Now there's another speaking, but it comes exactly by the same auspices. Sent ones who are in the wilderness in obedience to God and can be commanded what to say. And their, and their word is not a human sentiment. It's the word of the Lord. Don't you ministers know the difference between your word and the word of the Lord? That it's not enough merely to be biblical or to find it in a concordance or to make a message by putting together certain verses. It's the word of the Lord when it's the Lord's word, when it's given, not when we construct it. And that word is a life-saving word. Then the eyes of the blind are opened. Then the, the lame leap. Then waters break out of dry grounds. The word of God is powerful. It's event. But who can speak it? Those that are sent. Sent into the wilderness. Places that we would not ourselves desire. That might even be threatening. And to be with them at the time when they're hated and despised. You say to them, your saying will be a life-saving provision. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened in verse 5. The ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap as a, as a heart and the tongue of the dumb sing. For the wilderness shall, in the wilderness shall waters break out and streams in the desert and parched ground shall become a pool and thirsty land springs of water and the habitation of dragons will each lay. And a highway shall be there in a way and it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it but it shall be for those, the wayfaring men, though fools, shall not err therein. No lion shall be there, no dangerous, ravenous beast shall go there or thereupon. It shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. Whew. That Malaysian jungle, those primitive places, those last things that Jews ever thought to find themselves as a highway of holiness, that God can send me to Africa time and again and to tell my black brethren, God is going to construct a highway of holiness from Cape Town to Cairo and it will go through Zimbabwe and Zaire and every place now and Jews will find themselves plodding through it. We came to Kenya and Nairobi. I thought, oh, praise God, the capital city. I'm tired of being in the boondocks. Now we're going to come to a real church, a real building, a real service. And they led us up to a suburb of the city of Nairobi in the slums. And the, I never saw holes and dig pits in the road that will swallow cars. And you had to get there through the mud. And we finally got there. You know what the church was? A cargo container. And a large cargo container. There was no electric. They sat on rude benches. And I'm looking at these black faces and, and to speak to them the mystery of Israel in the last days. And did they ever receive it? Were they ever transformed in the first hearing of the word? And I could say to them at the end, the day is not distant when over the same pockmarked uh, crude road by which we stumbled and bumbled our way up to you, 
my brethren will also be coming and you'll take them in because you anticipate their arrival and they'll say to you how did you know to prepare and that we were coming well because three, five, seven however many years ago God sent us a Jewish messenger and told us to anticipate and to prepare and so we knew that you were coming and here is a place of refuge of food of safety of counsel of explanation of, su- of survival and salvation God is working saints I, I could tell you stories to ki- for the rest of the day of the places where I've been in the earth and uh, God is showing me places of refuge already in preparation there's a linkage it's an invisible thing it's a spirit directed thing and when it is called for it will be there and Jews will be moved from place to place through the nations passing probably through more than one nation because it's a three and a half year period of of flight before they return to Zion and in that time they will pass through Chinese congregations black congregations North American Indians they'll be on the Appalachian Trail they'll be on the Sierra Madre Mountains of Mexico with primitive Indians who believe and expect them and will succor them that they'll see in all of the variety of God's people the uniformity and consistency of God they'll see the same unconditional love the same patient forbearing acceptance the same spirit of sacrifice they will see the face of God in the wilderness and there he will meet with them that's what we used to do with my mother when she used to visit us in earlier years we sent her to this household for lunch, that household for breakfast, that household for supper. And she would come back and say, Oh, the children are so beautiful. Oh, it's so peaceful. Oh, it's so quiet. What beautiful families. So finally I said, Listen, Mom, you think it's a, a cultural accident that you see this consistency from household to household? You need to recognize that what you're seeing is a kingdom. It's the consistency of a kingdom that prevails in every house. There's a a precious, holy uniformity to impress you that this is not just human uh, affectation. This is God. And finally, all of that registered upon her soul. So, how does this chapter end? The redeemed, the ransomed of the Lord shall return. It means that perhaps they were there earlier and were expelled, but they were not at that time redeemed. Now they'll return as the redeemed of the Lord because something has happened in their wilderness trek. They've encountered something. They've encountered God face to face through Chinese believers. Can you believe it? We're not just dutiful and obligatory, but loving and acceptive and not easily, not offended at all. They've seen God. And they have come into his covenant and the bond of his authority. They shall return and come to Zion with songs and everlasting joy upon their heads. They shall obtain joy. It shall be given to them and gladness and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. We would be very poor students of scripture not to dwell on this capstone conclusion to see that it contains both everlasting joy but sorrow and sighing that the last historic experience of Israel, right up to the point of its redemption, is sorrow. They've lost their land. They've lost their state. They've lost their hope uh, that Israel had represented for them. They're cast out. They've lost their fortunes. They're stripped. They're nothing. There's sorrow. They've lost their children. They've seen their daughters raped. They've they've seen their, their mothers and fathers killed on the spot without mercy. There's sorrow and there's sighing but there's everlasting joy upon their heads because they'll not again be plucked up or rooted out because they need not again ever to be afraid of terror God will plant them in the land in great peace they will be his people they will know him they will call upon the name of the Lord they will serve him on his holy mountain it's a great climax and they will be the privileged people from whom The law shall go forth out of Zion and the word of the Lord out of Jerusalem to all nations so that the nations will study war no more. I'm reading from David Barron, Hebrew Christian 
Bible commentator, scholar, on his commentary from the book of Zechariah. Anything that you can get from David Barron is worth reading. And he writes, And at the end of the Lord and all his chastisements and judgments with which he has to visit his people on account of their great and manifold sins, but that they may by these very judgments, as well as by the abundant mercy which he will reveal to them in that day, be brought as a nation fully and forever to know him in all the divine perfections of his glorious character and to be able to fulfill their foreordained mission to show forth his praise and to proclaim his glory among the nations. This is a great statement. I'm going to read it again. I'll go slow. It's a summary of how to understand the chastisement, the deep uprooting, the casting away, the into the wilderness, the two-thirds that will perish, the remnant that survives. God going that far. But it has everything to do with the destiny and the call of the nation to make him known. You will know that I am the Lord in that day. Really know that I'm the God who raises the dead because I've brought you both to death and to resurrection. Because you've experienced both my severity and my kindness. You've tasted and sampled the totality of what I am as God experientially as a nation in the severest dealings that I've ever poured out on any people. But it's necessary because now you can make me know. Now you really know me. Now you know what salvation is. Now you know that when, when the, there's, with this, the condition is desperate and without hope, a word can save you if it's spoken by the inspiration of God through appointed ministers who have prophetic unction and authority to make that word an event. Now you see what I'm about. Now you know me. Here, that's what he's saying here. By these very judgments, as well as by the mercy which follows, that in that day they will be brought as a nation fully and forever to know him. If there's any nation upon whom the knowledge of God is most incumbent, it's Israel. Because we're called to be a nation of priests and a light unto the world. And if we cannot communicate the knowledge of God as he in fact is and not as men think him to be, who then shall? What is an apostle? What are these foundational men, prophets and prophets uh, uh, and apostles? Uh, because they're skilled, because they're verbal, because they have a knowledge of the mechanics of the kingdom? What is, what is their principal function that is foundational for the church? They bring the sense of God as God. They know Him in an intimacy. They have their citizenship in heaven. They've been dealt with through trial. They have a knowledge of that is inward. They're people of, of communion and devotion. They breathe out. They exhibit God. That's the foundation. God as He is. Because if we don't get that communicated, we're going to go off into our own flights of fancy and call it Jesus and make him an errand boy and some kind of a deity that serves our purposes as something less and other than he in fact is. God is being degraded. God is being minimized. God is being trivialized. God is being sentimentalized. The great and desperate urgent need of the church is the sense and knowledge of God as God. And nothing communicates that more than his conduct toward Israel, both in severity and in kindness, both in judgment and in mercy. Therefore, to miss that revelation is to lose the deepest apprehension of God as he in fact is. And for that reason, we're suffering greatly because even though we use the appellation Jesus, we're sticking a tag on something that is our creation and our image and not his own. We need foundational men who know him and exhibit him. And so Israel shall be able to fulfill their foreordained mission to show forth his praise and to proclaim his glory among the nations. Isn't that precious? You know what I wrote this morning while you were yet sleeping? How do you fulfill your mission? Dum, dum, dum. If their mission is fulfilled, 
by a knowledge of God obtained through trial, suffering, and judgment, how do you fulfill your mission? How is your mission different from their mission? In fact, your mission is to Israel as Israel's mission is to the nations. But if your mission doesn't get to them first, they have no mission to the nations. So I'm taking his quotation, believing it as a beautiful expression. They're able to fulfill their foreordained mission because they have learned through very judgment the abundant mercy and to know him in all of his divine perfections and his glorious character. How do you learn to know him? In his glorious character and his divine perfections. Bible study? Conferences? Healings, trials, wilderness experience, sifting of the kind that God was about last night, which I suspect you resisted. That was God's saints trying to bring us to a deeper place, but we were afraid and to relinquish the place that we presently know and enjoy. To let go and let God. How do we fulfill our mission? How do we obtain the knowledge of His divine perfections and glorious character? How do we existentially transcend mere creedal correctness to proclaim His glory to Israel? We must not be satisfied by me being merely doctrinally and creedally correct. Something more, the true knowledge of God has got to be communicated to the Jews when we meet with them in the wilderness. It's more than just feeding them a bottle of noodles. It's feeding them God. It's explaining to them their dilemma and their predicament that God is not arbitrary. They're not suffering some endless uh, 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 spout of uh, a mood of God, but there's a divine purpose being saved of so important a kind that it requires their expulsion, but it will also assure their return. The same God who who, who expends, who, who sends to the uttermost corners, also brings back the same power. You're going to know God. This, this is not some accident of history. This is not because there's a Hitler or an Islamic entity. It's because God is working through those instrumentalities to sift and perfect you, that you might come into the initial calling by which you shall bless all the families of the earth. Can you tell them that persuasively? Can you communicate God in more than just showing them doctrine and creed? I'm not knocking doctrine and creed, but it's no substitute for the existential, uh, experiential knowledge of God as God that can only come through relation, communion, through, through a walk with the Most High. How are you going to know Him and make Him known to them except that there's also some measure of suffering and trial in your life as in theirs to proclaim his glory to hear to our appropriation must precede theirs or they perish in the wilderness rather than return unless we ourselves know God in this way and can speak for him as him in his authority because the spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus You've not just taken on a coloration or a technique or a title. You've taken on the Lord when you can speak prophetically. It's his essential character where his own testimony is the spirit of prophecy. And God is saying, say to them, your God will come. Say it to them prophetically. Say it to them in the authority of God so that their blindness will, will, will dissipate and they'll leap though they were lame. And water will break out in the, in the very wilderness in dry places. What a word! Who can say, who can speak like that? And that authority, except they be in absolute union with the God who is the spirit of prophecy and can be commanded, say to them, to proclaim his glory is to set, his, set it forth, to exhibit it, being the thing in ourselves, to proclaim his glory I don't know how to say what that means. But I was reminded this morning that we have all sinned or fallen short of His glory. And it would be not excessive for us to be as much pricked by the failure to exhibit His glory as by the failure to sin. We have all sinned or fallen short 
of His glory. Don't think if we have avoided sin that we have uh, divine approval if we have fallen short of His glory. Merely to be doctrinally correct is not yet to proclaim His glory. To proclaim His glory is to show Him forth as He is in Himself, as being the thing in yourself. To be prophetic is not a technique, a method, or a title. It's an identification, it's a union with the God Himself who is the Spirit of prophecy. That, shows, that is showing forth His glory. It's an incarnational thing. You like that word? The mystery of incarnation, Christ in us, the hope of glory. There's no prospect for glory except Christ be in us. Not that we subscribe to the doctrines about Him, however correct. We're in Him, and He in us. And what is the distinctive of the great apostle? For me to live is Christ. In Him I move and live and have my being. I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. Paul is Jesus resurrected. It's not some Jewish man who has an exceptional brilliance and courage. It's the resurrection life of the risen and ascended Christ that is the distinctive uh, component and the key of the apostolic man. The union with Christ. He's showing forth his glory. For we have all sinned or fallen short of the glory that can only be obtained in this incarnational union. Christ in us, the hope of glory. There's no one who uses the phrase in Christ more frequently than Paul. You cannot read a page of Ephesians or Colossians or wheresoever you turn in his apostolic writings where he's not saying in Christ, in Christ, in Christ, in Christ. And we have dismissed that as if it's some kind of flourish, a little little rhetoric, a little stylistic device. No, it's the key to the genius of Paul as an apostle. And it's the key for us in speaking to them in the wilderness. Are you in Christ and Christ in you? Are you in union with him or just merely subscribing correctly uh, to who he is in a respectful way? This is what the last night's message was about. God bringing a man down and out and into a grim place and testing him and saying, can you believe that these bones can live? Because this faith is beyond anything that you've known or exercised, even prophetically till now. I'm stretching you to breaking, because you need to come to a place beyond what you knew, even prophetically, and were able to express by faith. You need the faith of the Son of God, for only that faith can believe that those bones can live. All you can say is, uh, 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 you know, Lord... No, you've got to believe it. Because if you don't believe it, how then shall you address it? What will your word be to those bones if it's not a word of faith that believes to that resurrection? And not only the faith that believes, but that desires the resurrection and can be spoken in love and not sentiment. Because I tell you that not all the church wants to see those bones live. That the son of the prodigal the brother of the prodigal son did not attend the party. He couldn't even come into the house. He was so resentful. And finally he counted his father, you never made a party for me. And I was, I was always been a dutiful son. Blah, 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 blah. Pharisee. Your brother has come back. It's life from the dead. And you can't come in and celebrate? No, because you're resentful. Because you want the father's fortune. Because you want... Of his recognition exclusively and let that bum who went out and, and misspent his fortune suffer the consequence. I want the exclusive attention of God. Don't think that that's not a factor in the church that doesn't welcome back Israel, that doesn't want to share the glory of God with, with a returned prodigal son. They want him exclusively for themselves and they'll construct a theology that fits it. You've got to desire those bones to come to life and love them and know that the glory of God is more than abundant both for the prodigal who returns and the son who has been faithful we can well afford their return and rejoice for it as our sister reminded us in the, in the scriptures today in the Psalms and rejoicing for Jerusalem 
unless we have that love, that desire, that expectancy, our prayer for their resurrection will be vain. It's His love. It's God in the flesh, the incarnation of deity and humanity that they have got to find in the wilderness. You know what the rabbi said when I went to New York? For one year, every once a week, I traveled, oh, what was it? 75, 100 miles to meet with one rabbi, Blumenthal, you can pray for him. Darling man, seven beautiful children, his wife Esther. He met with me, though I was an apostate Jew, believing in some Greek myth that a man could be God. How can you, what kind of a Jew are you that you can subscribe to such tripe? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to save you from that notion. I'll meet with you weekly. We'll discuss the scriptures. What a privilege. It was nothing to pay $20 worth of uh, bridge tolls and gas just to see this man and spend four or five hours once a week with Rabbi Blumenthal. Till we finally came to such an impasse that he began to insult me and the Lord. And I said, well, it's no longer profitable. But the relationship is still on the shelf, requiring your prayer. He said one day, well, I said to him, you know, no man has ever loved you as I. For all of your, your Judaistic colleagues and rabbis and congregations, you, you have never been loved more than, than by this apostate Jew. And he said to me, you're all wrong, Art. Your theology, your notions, they're pagan, they're Greek. God can't be a man. But there's an aura about you, Art, that I cannot deny. They need to be encountered in the wilderness by the reality of God that is incarnate in men. The mystery of incarnation is an offense even to the church. Are you trying to say, Art, that it's not you who is speaking? Sounds like you. Even has a Brooklyn accent. Are you trying to say that your speaking and your conduct and your thought and is God? Who are you that you think you have so exalted a relationship? Are you able to discern the truth of what the man is and represents? Or are you offended by it because you want to bring him down to your earthly level uh, on the level of human religious accomplishment? Because if he's right that he can be in Christ and that lives out of that life and serves out of that life, then it is an indictment for you living at a lesser place. Well, I hope you can understand that. That's why my marriage has been unhappy. Well, I don't know if that's the word for it. You'll have to talk to Inger. Difficult. Gentile of the Gentiles. You'll not find a more Gentile woman than my wife. Living with the Hebrew of the Hebrews. What a tension, what a conflict for over 40 years. Doesn't understand me. I spoke once about sexual innuendo, and she thought I was saying sex in the window. <laughs> so on top of everything else, we had a language barrier. It's a scandal even for the church to hear a man say, for me to live as Christ. We're so easily um, distracted because we focus upon his humanity. And how can that be God? If it were God, wouldn't it sound like, Thus saith the Lord? It sounds so natural. It can't be God. But that's the mystery, you dear saints. Christ in us, the hope of glory. How else can a man go day and night here and then to Singapore, and then every nation in Europe without exception for nine, ten weeks, day and night. Except it's Christ in us, the hope of glory. The infinite and inexhaustible life of God. It's the rest of God that is prepared for those who believe. It's the Shabbat that doesn't, doesn't just take place on the seventh day, but every day for those whose labors issue out of his rest. <clears throat> are you in that place? Do you desire to be? Are you willing for the death of everything that impedes that reality? You prefer to remain 
above and not come down and into. That's the issue, saints. Israel will not be redeemed in the wilderness except they meet the incarnational life of Christ in men who are there. You're not going to find it in that day if you have not found it before and consistently moved and lived and had your being in it. You're going to have to test to see if the resurrection really works. As I did as a high school teacher, as a new believer, faced five times a day with students who were required to take my course as an obligation, many of them black, Oakland, California, the Black Panther neighborhood of the most terroristic, anti-white, anti-institutional segment in the population in California. There I was a teacher. An idealist, a Jewish idealist, and trying to raise the level uh, intellectually and encouragingly for my students. And it's exhausting. I've done hard work in my life, but nothing harder than being a teacher. I'd come home at the end of the school day and I'd just fall on my bed and go out like a light. It was exhausting to body, mind, soul, and spirit to engage these students and to hold their attention when they're in rebellion and hate your guts because you're white. So I was exhausted and my colleagues were saying, Art, you're going to burn yourself out. You you need to take it easy. Preserve yourself. Come down from the cross. Save yourself. It's the same cry. I said, no. The Bible speaks about resurrection power and of that we're brought to a newness of life. We're raised unto another life. I'm going to believe for that, Lord. So I went to school believing for that. And sure enough, by the third period of the day, I was hoarse. My voice was fading. My eyes were clamming shut. My tongue was stuck to the roof of my mouth. I couldn't remember my own name. I was so exhausted and done in. And just at about that time, I I saw the guys in the back of the room who knew that they would fail from the beginning. They had nothing to lose. And now they had an opportunity to really get whitey. They were beginning to come out of their seats in a physically threatening way. Everything was lost. Listen to the saints. This is the drama of resurrection. Resurrection is always a final, last moment's provision from God. Just when everything seems to be failing and there's no hope for any alternative, then the life comes forth for those who believe. And in that moment, just when it looked desperate, something began to move up in my loins and up into my chest. And my head cleared, my eyes opened, my tongue was loosed, and I began to speak in authority and command. And in day after day, in that power, the Lord filled the entire youth section of our Assemblies of God Church in Oakland, California, with converts out of my classes. Seventeen received the Lord in one classroom session on a review for a final examination when I put on the blackboards all of the collapse of the world and its categories and what hope is there and spoke of the Lord and salvation and the belief of Israel and the God and his blood and how many would, would call on his name and desire that salvation. You should see the hands go up. Follow me in a prayer in a classroom. Resurrection is power. But you've got to be willing to pull the plug out of your own humanity your own confidence in your flesh, your own strength, because it's terrifying uh, to lose that control. And if God be not God and there's no resurrection, we of all men are most to be pitied. Are you willing to trust? Or are you living on your Chinese confidence in yourself, falling short of the glory for the issue of the resurrection is the issue of the glory? So this is the rest that God has prepared for the people of God. Ironically, there's nothing that offends Jews more and Rabbi Blumenthal more than that God should be a man, that God should be incarnate in flesh. And yet, it is that very demonstration that will save them in the wilderness. Men saying to them, your God will come. In the very authority of God, the very miracle of incarnation will save them, though it is presently the scandal that offends them. But you have to exhibit it. And it's the bride adorned for the bridegroom, having the glory of God 
that descends out of heaven from God. To, to come to this place of union is not only to be Israel's deliverer, but the Lord's escort and companion eternally as the bride of Christ, having the glory of the Lord. And you attained it because of your faithfulness in yielding and coming into that place for Israel's sake. But the ultimate and the eternal expression is bridal. So Lord, what a mystery. It, the subject of Israel is not a tangent. It's not a little sideline. It's at the heart of the whole epical drama of what can be called apostolic. It brings us and calls us into this resurrection mode for nothing else will suffice. And so I'm praying for the Church of Asia, Lord, and all that is represented here, that they will move into this realm. They'll not be satisfied to occupy that upper stratosphere. They're willing to come down and into the place of grit, demand, reality, and truth, and hard things, where something is required more than what they've known charismatically, evangelically, fundamentally. It's the life of God himself. That they might say with Paul, for me to live is Christ. And are willing to risk that Sunday morning at the platform and at the pulpit. And not come prepared to the teeth to avoid embarrassment because they've worked out a whole sermon that is letter perfect. But that they can gasp and stutter and believe and choke and wait for the, the word to come by the life of God that will be life-giving. And not just mediated out of their own humanity to save them from embarrassment. There's more, there's an issue greater than their embarrassment or the threat of failure. It's the glory of God. And the, and the church needs to hear such sermons, needs to hear that kind of proclamation, needs to see men who are the visible embodiment of a resurrected and ascended Christ. So my God, come, you're pleading, you're calling, you're stirring, bring us the dis, the discontentment, my God, with just being correct having it together, the kinds of things that we're able to do and to perform at that level. Bring us to that transcendent place, that union, that ultimate thing, my God, where it cannot be said where we end and you begin, that we can say with Paul as boldly, for us to live as Christ. Bless this church, Lord. Let Asia be impacted by a church of this kind, and Jews who find themselves in the wilderness of Asia find their their God and His face in a people who are not self-consciously spiritual and mindlessly and naturally exhibit and reveal the glory of Israel's God. Perform this, Lord, we pray. We thank and give you praise for the privilege of the calling, the high calling in Christ Jesus, in whose name we ask it, and God's people said, Amen. Amen.